close to good evening, everybody. I am the Dean at the University of North Carolina School of the Arts, School of Filmmaking, and very happy to be here for a second year in a row. It struck me that our alumni, both, and we've only been a film school for 22 years, are having a bigger and bigger presence here. And one of the most interesting things for them is that often it's their first movie or their second movie, and they've always asked the question, what happens next? So we thought that this would be a really appropriate discussion to have in a more public forum. So thank you, and I'll leave it to Dana. Thank you so much. Um, we were just talking in the green room about the, because it is such an amazing achievement to get into Sundance, and it is so difficult to get there, it is perfectly reasonable to believe that that can be enough. At the same time, if there's any doubt about that, I invite you to take a look at the catalogs of the past 10 years and you will find many filmmakers in there who have gone on to great things and there'll be filmmakers in there that you have never heard of again. I think what we're looking at in the panel is to figure out the best way to give yourself the best shot uh, going forward. And I'm afraid I am gonna pick on you first, not, not only because you're sitting next to me, but because you had a film here before. And I wanna know what that was, what was your state of mind when you, got, when you came here the first time? I thought it was a life changer, for sure. When I got the phone call saying you were accepted to Sundance, uh, and we were a film that had no reason to uh, believe or expect we could get in. So when we did, uh, I thought it was a true life changer, and it is, but um, there was a little bit of a, root, a rude awakening when you go, and then the movie, in our case, did a, so extremely well with critics, and the audiences seemed to like it, and we won the audience award. And then you, know, you, you kind of get, get carried away a little bit, and you're like, man, it's, it's all coming up, Chad. Uh, but then uh, it's really, really hard to translate that into anything tangible. Was there anything tangible initially? Uh, there's a there's a tangible heat. There's that heat they talk about. That's a very real thing. And then you go back to LA, and everyone wants to meet with you, and they want to hear what you want to do. Um, and then I'd be like, well, I'll tell you, I want to make this movie about a chubby black kid in Germany who wants to hump his pillow a lot. And they're like, alrighty. <laughs> um, so uh, those didn't go so well. And uh, but that's a very that's like kind of the only tangible thing that came out of it is that your name is out there and everyone uh, has heard of the movie because they were paying attention at Sundance and there's like a two week period where you can really capitalize on that by trying to meet as many people as possible. But I think that if you're as long as you're trying to make a movie that's not exactly the same as the movie you just made, it's going to be very difficult. Alex, in your experience, what is the biggest misconception that you see from um, filmmakers at Sundance. Gosh, I mean, there are so many movies that come here and they take, and they're always so different. Um, some, you know, each, each film has gone through a rigorous process, of course, even to get here, which is success in itself. But I think, you know, it's really about how the audience reacts to the films, how the critics react to the films, how the buyers react to the films that changes the dynamic about, um, how those films are received, and I think you can't quite predict that. When, when you get to that moment, you sort of have to leave it to the gods, if you will. Um, but each film has its own little, little experience once they're in Sundance. Rebecca, t uh, tell us a little bit about what your experience was like in terms of, you know, in terms of you know, now you know, you're a successful producer, but what was your, you know, what was your kind of your trial by fire? I think for us, Ours, you know, we had It Follows, which the play, the Cannes Film Festival in 2014, and then had both movies here, but Dreams was the premiere. So I think we took a lot of lessons learned from going through the It Follows experience. And I think that for us, it was um, figure, not, figuring out the sales process in an economical way, not necessarily finding out like who was gonna be the best partner. We had a lot of sales fees on It Follows that kind of worked against the filmmakers in terms of ever making money on their movie. It was very top heavy in fees. And so going into I'll See You in My Dreams, um, we as producers wanted to kind of find a way to have partners, but not in a way that was gonna financially put the filmmakers at the bottom. So on I'll See You in My Dreams, um, my producing partner and I, Laura, acted as co-sales reps on the film. So we found a partner who was gonna sell it with us and split the fee so that our fee went back into the movie, which went to the filmmakers. So instead of somebody taking a 10% fee, they were only taking five. And that was really kind of a big step forward for us as producers in doing something quite different um, 
that we plan to do kind of going forward. Is that something that can be taught at all in school? It can be taught. I think this is a particular subject that I'm really hearing a lot about now at the festival from other producers who are really kind of struggling. You know, Chad made a comment just a little while ago, like, oh, you're, you're rich off it follows. Well, I'm not and I'm never going to be because it's too top heavy in sales fees, honestly. I think it's more about the experienced producers coming together and coming up with a different system that works you know, as, as filmmaking, uh, we're making movies in a much different way than we used to, so it's up to us to really shift the models because the people making the money are never going to shift the models. They don't want to. <laughs> so, I, it, so it's been a big conversation amongst producers at this festival that I've noticed talking about how do we fix this because it's really working against us sustaining a career. I mean, I don't think, you know, a sales agent taking 10 or 15 percent is the problem because $100 comes in and you have to pay $15 that's worth it. Same with uh, uh, a rep, same with a uh, PR agent. They're really important that filmmakers are protected while well, all of that going in. Now, tons and tons of films are selling. Um, in 2010, I think only 10% of films sold. Now we're seeing because of the digital revolution, 90% of the films here are selling. And it's, you know, just as Peter said, they're not selling for that much, but you have to know how to navigate it and you need experienced people to do it. And I think Rebecca, as she said, is special in that she's had a lot of experience, but you need to protect yourselves. You know, you, I mean, you were apologizing for saying, you know, that it, you know, producers taking back the responsibility of sales, and I don't think that's a bad thing at all. I mean, look, agencies will always be nimble. They'll always find ways, and whether it's packaging fees and helping to find financing in other ways, it's, it's better to work with experienced producers, and I've, de I've definitely done deals where you split those fees. But in choosing a sales agent, too, because the, you're sitting behind so many fees, you want to make sure you're with people that you trust. And when you get into Sundance, you get a lot of calls from publicists and agents from all sides, but especially from the sales group. But again, across the board and agnostic to all agencies, it really is the agent you're working with and less sort of the institution. I think that one of the things I've, one of the biggest mistakes I've seen filmmakers make is that they don't call for recommendations from other filmmakers when they're choosing their sales agent. It's like you're interviewing the sales agent. They're not interviewing you. So you need to ask them the questions you want to know. It's like, how are you going to talk to me, communicate? How are you going to give me information? What other movies do you have? And because you're the filmmaker, it's always, that you know, they're the big guns, the gatekeepers, and you always feel the opposite way. But you got to remember, you're the one with the movie. How much responsibility is a filmmaker, does a filmmaker have in terms of uh, being educated about the full process? You know, Orson Welles said it best. He said it's 98% hustle and 2% filmmaking. And that's the truth. You, you gotta hustle. You gotta hustle your film. You're in Sundance. It doesn't sell for a million dollars. It sells for $25,000. That's still a great opportunity for you. Take advantage of that. Run with it. You get it, you know, even if you're getting jobs doing web series or branded entertainment, you, you know, you're working in the film business until your next film. As much information as possible. I mean, and, and it's out there. I mean, not, not deal points specifically, but you know, you'll run into situations, and I ran into this in distribution a lot, where you've got a lot, a lot of young filmmakers, they come to Sundance, they're, they, they sell their film, and then they realize the release commitment is only a, a small theatrical, and that just actually devastates them. But when you actually look at how things have been windowing and how, with the way that uh, the film industry has been going, you can see how this is actually very clearly laid out. Um, what films are actually sort of selling for, what sales agents are selling, what they've had on their slate, what kind of you know, luck and work that they've been doing. Um, so uh, you know, going into it, when you start getting those calls, the information's there. As a, as a director, I would say that I, I, there were many times post-graduating film school that I was frustrated that I was not taught something about the business, or that I wasn't taught about film festival navigation or where a good premiere is and all that stuff. But at the same time, I think Practically speaking, it, you can't like spend so much of the time in film school learning that stuff because it's a little bit of putting the cart before the horse. And I really appreciate the fact that at NCSA, I spent almost all of my time making films. I want to uh, open the floor for questions. Do we have a microphone? Okay, yeah, right there. Um, for someone who comes to a festival like this, how do you make those meaningful connections with producers or other filmmakers? Um, it beyond just handing each other business cards, how do you make those connections transfer into the, the post-Sundance world? I think the worst thing to do is hand business cards. There's a, 
an amazing producer named Lynette Howell that gave advice to somebody that I overheard, which was, you know, uh, form a relationship before you ask somebody to do something for you. So your, your best thing to do is just to get to know people, be the guy having fun and supporting and talking about movies. And, and you know, when people just like you, they're more apt to look at your material than just meeting you and you pitching, at least for me. Yeah. I, it, it, it's like, it makes a world of difference. Just be here and be fun, have fun, and then follow up after with the people you, re you really connected with. You're gonna meet people, you, you know, if you're out there and, and you're friendly and you approach it where you're not trying to just handing people a script and trying to form a real kind of bond over the, the over filmmaking, over the art of film, yeah, truly. The, yeah, and the biggest mistake I get, people message me on Facebook and all these places and no one ever asks me, am I even looking for something? And if you are looking for something, what are you looking for? What is your taste, Rebecca? Like if you're gonna give me a script, so most people don't even go as far to even ask that. The thing that's absolutely irreplaceable about film festivals is the chance to get a little drunk and talk to people. It is absolutely invaluable just in terms of being able to have a connection with somebody and you actually have a connection. You're not just some schmuck who's handing a business card. That's how business happens at the higher end too. Totally. I mean, truly. Yeah, the what, what do you think golf is? Yeah. <laughs> Hi, um, you've been talking about uh, relationships with producers, reps, and sales agents and distribution companies. And I want to learn uh, a little bit more about your relationships with your financiers after you sell your first film. Do you continue with the same people? How do you find financing after you sell your first film? How does that affect your second film and so on? You know, every film's different. It depends on when you're selling your film, what kind of controls your financiers have, what they don't, who signs off on deals. Really important things to figure out before you start making your movie. There are very few repeat financiers, actually, um, because a lot of people do lose money. Deals aren't that lucrative right now for most movies, and so it's really challenging, and everyone you know, is now saying to me, oh, well, it should be a piece of cake. You had two box office hits, everything. And it's like, it's not. It doesn't, it certainly makes it, I was a tad easier, the visibility is different, I can, I can show that I can get your investment back, but it's not like this quick fix of, okay, now I can get money from anywhere. And that just goes to what I said earlier, where it's like, every time it's starting from scratch, yeah. unless you're making the same exact movie, which nobody who plays at Sundance, I think, is really interested in. So, say you have an independent feature film and you don't think it's going to get into Sundance, how do you sell that and make your money back on that? Well, there's a lot of other festivals that are also good, but even if you don't get into those festivals, um, a sales agent or a rep can help you get deals. And it, you know, the, they can get it in front of distributors, but we're talking about distributors around the world, so you're not only talking about North America. Sometimes films are better suited for one festival or another. Not every film is necessarily going to play well at Sundance and might be better in another, in another festival. I mean, you'll see that all the time, the sort of the Sundance South by Southwest sort of match up. I mean, every film is absolutely different, but I would say work under the model that you're not gonna get into Sundance and make sure you have that plan before you even send your film there. If you don't get into one of the major f festivals that are considered acquisitions festivals, your chances of having a sale that makes your investor back decreases exponentially. Like, very, like more than you wanna know. So, um, you know, and, and it's, like, it's like, there's Toronto, there's Cannes, there's Berlin, Rotterdam, like there are, I mean, there are other festivals, South by, AFI, but even AFI, you know, if, if you're not one of the major five acquisitions festivals, you better be making your movie for under about $200,000. I actually made a movie before This Is Martin Bonner called Luke and Brie Are On A First Date, which was like $3,000 uh, in 2007. And it couldn't buy its way into a film festival. It got, it got rejected from every festival, including the festival ran, run by my old school. Uh, <laughs> so, um, like, but, the, and I was so ready to give up on it as ever being seen by anybody, but then, you know, it got into one tiny thing and I, it played, and then it, it got into another tiny thing and it played, and then it played at a film festival in Argentina. And I didn't get to go, but uh, I heard about it because this one, guy emailed me and he's like, hey, I saw your film in Argentina, I'm an Argentinian filmmaker, and I'd like to buy the remake rights. And I was like, yeah, right. Um, but I answered him and I was like, I'll we'll see how this goes in, uh, until he asked for my credit card number. Uh, and then it, it turned out to be legit. This uh, Argentinian filmmaker bought the remake rights for $10,000 um, and now there's a, a $1 million budgeted Argentinian movie that's based on the $3,000 one that I made that never played anywhere significant. And uh, the lesson I learned from that is that each film will have its own crazy weird life no matter how small. And you can be always surprised 
at what happens if you get eyeballs in front of it. And on that note, um, we have to wrap up, but thank you guys so much for being here. Thank you.